We've made it to the first weekend in August of Season 20 in Master Duel since the reset. We're currently on a six win streak with Floan Ruiz, of course, one win away from Diamond 3. Just a quick update before I get into today's match against Trap Tricks. I did make a slight update to the decklist that I posted just a couple days ago. Um, I was on a five win streak with that decklist and I actually made this change and I won my sixth match in a row because I drew the Call by the Grave. So what we did was we took out a third Book of Moon and uh, one of the traps just because they weren't really coming up. Um, maybe I'll put them back in if I get higher up in the ranks. But right now I'm, I am seeing Ash everywhere. I'm seetng less Imperm, less like Dragos to Paleas, Baguskas, etc. So the Book of Moon as an offensive defensive option I think is a little bit limited right now in the uh, Diamond rank. And Call by the Grave definitely has a lot of utility. What's nice about this too is that if you negate Ash when you go first, like say you open this card and your opponent ashes you and you, you're going first and you end up negating the Ash, um, it's really good because during your opponent's turn when you try to use your Dreaming Town, if they have a second Ash, they can't use it or if they do, it'll be negated because Call by negates it until the end of the next turn. So you negate it on your turn. It's also negated for the opponent's turn. And then when it's passed back to you, then they can activate their Ash again. But at that point, you've already likely set up full combo and Dreaming Town stopped them from whatever they're doing. And like I said, this card won me the game because I had to advent away uh, an Apex to get a Robina and the opponent ashed and I had the call by and I went full combo. So uh, maybe I'll play that match for you. It's not really too significant of a match, but I'll play it for you just in case on my next video. But let's go ahead and take a look at this Trap Trick matchup, which I think was super interesting. In this video, we're going to take a look at Floanderies versus Trap Tricks, which is a deck you'll probably run into a fair amount in Diamond and probably a few times into Master. But the deck is definitely decent. Uh, I got new support, obviously, in the latest pack release in July, and it can OTK. It can set up pretty powerful Link monsters. But as you guys know, with Empin, you can negate all of those Link monsters if you can set up. Going second, it can be a little bit of a challenge. What you really have to watch out for against Trap Tricks is actually their rank four Xyz plays because they can go into things like Baguska, the Rafflesia, um, I'm just gonna call this Pingu, uh, as well as a few others. And it could be very problematic for you uh, to deal with because your small birds would have a hard time playing through the interruptions that these rank four Xyz puts up. Now, Sarah is essentially the core engine of the deck. You know, limiting Empin to one is kind of like limiting Sarah to one. If you out this, they have no recursion, no advantage build up. So it's kind of like the equivalent for us Flo Andres players, right? If you out the Sarah, it's very hard for them to kind of keep their engine rolling. So what you're gonna see here actually is me attempt to dig for an evenly match because that does really hard counter um, trap tricks. But unfortunately, off of the Pot of, Des uh, Pot of Prosperity, sorry, as well as our opening hand, we don't get that. So that was 11 cards deep right into the deck. Six draws and, oh no, six more for the uh, Pot of Prosperity. So 12 cards deep, no evenly, that's unfortunate. So we're gonna have to try to play through Engine on the activation of map. I actually was not aware of this, but they banished the Holotea and special summon back the Mermelo. And that special summon effect has the ability to pop a spell or trap. It's not once per turn, so they end up popping my map. And I was like, oh, okay, uh, I did not plan to have to play around the whole Atea. I knew that it was in the graveyard, but I just forgot that like it would bring back the Mermelo and pop my map. So it is what it is. At this point now, I'm trying to play through this myriad of back row. And if you were paying attention in the beginning, you know what they've set. And a lot of the trap trick cards actually deal with special summoned monsters. And that's obviously something that we can play around. So we know they have a bottomless set here. And we know that they have this terrifying trap hole, which has no utility against us is a dead card to have that set here. So we got two unknowns here, I believe. Um, or did they set a whole Atea yet? Maybe not, but they activate Torrential, so they reveal one of the three unknowns. And we're actually going to chain one of our advents here because we need to get the Stree to hand off of one of these two birds on the field in order to continue summoning so that we can still search for the Empin and summon the Empin. Because if we just search for Empin here, um, we're kind of screwed and we only have the Toucan left to summon, right? So we have to get that and just hope that we can continue on summoning, which we are able to. And I'm going to activate the Robina on Chainlink 2. The opponent opts to activate Sarah here and the Pingu, which will attach that Robina, unfortunately. Uh, so really bad because a trap caused the monster to leave the field. So the Pingu has the ability to absorb that monster from graveyard or banished. Now they're gonna be able to bring back the Mermelo again. Actually, this is one from, no, that is the one from the graveyard, yeah. So, or is it? No, I guess, yeah, that's one from deck because the one in, uh, the one that was in, originally in the graveyard is banished. So <laughs> this is how crazy Sarah is, right? It's trapped, it's monsters, it's just crazy. So the second Mermelo, not once per turn, is gonna be able to pop the dimensional fissure um, 
and that's not great for us obviously because we do want to see their monsters get banished so that they can't recur them like they have been doing uh, but we are still going to be able to put up the Empin and that is now going to negate the Sarah. Not too impactful this turn because the opponent has already used both the effects of Sarah. But moving forward, it will not uh, be impactful unless they can out the Empin. So they do reveal, of course, the Grave Digger's Trap Hole. They always have this. They usually just play like one or two, uh, but they seem to always have it. So this was the second unknown. Uh, and we know that they just set a hold of Taya. We know this is a bottomless. We know this is the terrifying Trap Hole. So it's just this unknown that we have to worry about now. And I think we know the card in hand is the Arachno Kampa as well. So I'm actually like not in a bad position because it doesn't seem like they can actually out this Empin. So battle phase, I'm not going to worry about the Sarah because I'm negating it now with the Empin. I'm actually going to try and out the Pingu, which I do. And now I don't have to worry about this thing um, wreaking havoc against me during the opponent's next turn. Now I do have to worry about this Mermelo because again, this is a level four that they can potentially rank four with because we know they have the Arachno Kampa in hand. So all they can really do is activate map and set to pass. In the end phase, they're going to quick effect special summon the Arachno Kampa. And let's see what they top deck. Again, we know three of their cards. And you might be wondering, well, why didn't they bottomless trap hole the Empin? It pro in hindsight, this does make sense to do because it enables their Sarah for their turn. Them not bottomlessing this Empin, like it's kind of pointless because like, yeah, Empin will just recur itself with the Toucan. It goes straight to Banish, which is beneficial for me. I just bring it back, summon it. I get it, another spell and trap search off the Empin. But they actually needed to do that because they needed to utilize their Sarah. And by not doing that and leaving the Empin on board, um, their, yeah, their, their Sarah is just turned off. They probably thought they could rank four Xyz their way out of this Empin to turn their Sarah back online, like going into a Baguska, switches the Amp into defense, negates it, their Sarah is back online, right? So I was just hoping at the start of main phase one, they didn't end up just going straight into a rank four Xyz because they normal summon Pudica first, which makes sense, right? You know, top deck a normal monster, you don't want to go into Paguska, then this card has no utility. So summon this first, that's going to trigger map, they're going to get their field spell search, which is, which is actually pretty good uh, because field spell is, um, you know, does a lot for this deck actually. But now we're going to be able to go Empin and we're just going to recur everything because at this point we don't have to worry about Ash. And I doubt that this last card is a second Grave Digger's Trap Hole because like I said, they usually only play two or maybe even just one. So I don't have to worry about that. Clearly it's not an Imperm. This is likely like a card that deals with special summon monsters. It could be like a D barrier uh, or, or like Terra, what was the networking Trap Hole or so something like that. Uh, something that is not significant against Flow Andres. So again, another reason why Flow Andres can be beneficial is because we don't special summon, so we play around a lot of the trap cards that Trap Tricks plays. So you're going to see me go for a unique play here, and I go for the Snowl over the Apex or over the Avion. And again, this is an instance where Snowl comes in handy. Um, and just a quick caveat, so when I normal summon Stria, I banished the Robina in the graveyard that was attached to the Pingu. So that's really beneficial. That gets my Robina back in rotation. But the reason I go for Snowl is exactly for this reason, because I anticipated they were going to bottomless trap hole, and I wanted to be able to recur the Snowl with the Toucan here. And I need to flip the opponent's monsters face down so that they can't rank four Xyz. Now, of course, if I flip these face down, they're still going to be able to flip them face up because they haven't changed battle position this turn. So I actually activate the Snowl to get rid of my last bird. And you might be thinking, well, Quantum, you just screwed yourself. Now you have nothing to use off of Dreaming Town. Well, I'm going to actually chain my second Advent of Adventure to banish the Snowl to search for, again, if you watch my decklist video, which is linked in the description, my second token, which comes in super clutch here because now off of Trap Card, I'm going to be able to summon this token and bring back the Snowl. I'm bringing back these birds, but I've already used their effects. So even off of Dreaming Town, I can't use them. Uh, or I guess, yeah, I guess I could use the Robina. Never mind. So Robina could have searched for the token here, which is, yeah, inconsequential. But it does actually make a difference, and I'll show you why in a second. Uh, so yeah, Robina and Tukin were the only birds we haven't used because we use Eaglin and Stree, obviously, for the, the search and summon of the Snowl. So off of the Tukin, we bring back the Snowl here, and we're going to banish Trap Card, which will flip all of their cards face down. So you notice I activated Dreaming Town on the flip summon of the first uh, monster, the Arachno Kampa, and now I flip down the normal summon. They can only flip back up the Mermelo, so they need another way to get another level 4 on board in order to rank 4 Xyz. So you can see how aggressively I'm pushing to keep them off the rank 4. What's also nice about Snowl is this is a once, um, once per turn um, effect, not like once per card effect. So I can actually, now that I've resummoned this to the field, I can actually activate this effect again to flip their monsters face down. So sure enough, they flip summon Mermelo, they activate um, the garden here, and I 
didn't even realize this. Uh, I was, I think I was on like 40 seconds. So I don't know why I'm always going to time, but you know, thinking through all the lines, it's very complicated. You can banish one monster you control, special summon a trap trick monster from the hand or graveyard. So I guess they could technically bring back Pingu here, um, but obviously they're gonna bring back Dayanea. So I could have just DD Crowed. Um, I don't know why I didn't, because this doesn't target, right? It doesn't say target a card and bring it back, and then in which case I can DD Crowed remove the target and then this card fizzles. So that if I banish the Dianea, they can bring back the uh, Pingu, I think, but that doesn't do anything because um, it doesn't have any material and they can't rank four Xyz with this card as well, right? So it was kind of inconsequential. So the Dianea actually gets back the Gravedigger's Trapple, which isn't great. And I am going to then use the Snowl to actually banish the uh, DD Crow in order to flip their monsters face down, again, preventing the rank four Xyz. Using Snowl's effect twice and the Dreaming Town to completely you know, keep their field face down to prevent the Xyz play. So the Dayanea from the first turn ends up banishing the Terrifying Trapple. We know that they're on Gravediggers and on uh, Holotea, which we knew Holotea was not activatable because it does say that you have to discard a normal trap card, I believe. You can activate this turn, activate this card, the turn it was set by discarding one normal trap card. So they can activate it this turn because it wasn't set this turn now, like they set it during my turn, right? But activating this doesn't do anything. It just puts it on the field and that's it, right? Um, so uh, let me just double check because I'm pretty sure that's what it is. Yeah. And then, yeah, they need to get it in the graveyard to get the effect to banish it. So activating Holotea here doesn't do anything. We draw for turn and we draw Robina, which is actually important because I could, I think, play around the Gravedigger Trapel by summoning like Eaglin and then activating this effect first and then activating the Eaglin. So I do a reverse chain link than I normally would to play around it. But because I drew um, Robina, I'm like, oh, it doesn't really matter. So I activate map, banish the uh, advent, or sorry, the unexplored winds here. And I still have three summons because of Snowl, normal summon for turn, plus two from Snowl. The, I bait the opponent's Gravedigger's Trap Hole, let them think that, yeah, you can banish or negate the Robina here. I already drew one, that's fine. Uh, I normal summon Robina anyways. Again, we know this is a Holotea and this card clearly isn't anything that threatens us. So at this point, I'm just gonna bring everything back because obviously we don't have to worry about Ash. And I have multiple summons and we're gonna be able to loop this Monarch a bunch of times here. Uh, so that the first thing we're gonna do, summon the Monarch, put back the Field Spell and the Bottomless, making them draw Bottomless first. Uh, the Field Spell protects their cards from battle for one, uh, one instance. So I just wanna get that off the field because the Snowl on board also will do piercing damage through all of this. And I'm basically gonna stack their deck a whole bunch for useless cards, as well as, um, yeah, just kind of out their whole board at this point, right? So I think once we get back the unexplored wins, the opponent kind of realizes, yep, they've got kind of full engine rolling. They've got the recursion with the Ryza, and that's just a GG. So that's how we were able to battle back, even through some misplays, but uh, ultimately making the clutch plays that matter to beat Trap Tricks going second.